Okay, everybody. Uh, today we'll start the most important system of our body, the nervous system. It is not only the most important system, it is the most complicated system of your body. You know that two systems are called the control systems, right? The nervous system and the endocrine system. So nervous system is the main control system of your body. It regulates most of the body functions to maintain homeostasis. First, first we will talk about the functions of the nervous system. important functions then we'll talk about the divisions of the nervous system how we classify the nervous system okay then we'll talk about the cells different types of cells present in the neural tissue two types of cells are present in the neural tissue you already know that neurons and neuroglial cells. Neurons are the main type and neuroglial cells are the supporting cells. You must remember when you saw the neural tissue or nervous tissue under the microscope, the big cells, those are the neurons, right? And many tiny dots, those are the neuroglial cells. So those are two types of cells in the neural tissue. First, we'll talk about the supporting cells and their functions. That means neuroglia and their functions. Then we'll talk about the main cells, the neurons, different types of neurons, parts of a neuron and functions. Then we'll see the structures called tracts, nuclei, gray matter, white matter. If you cut the brain or the spinal cord, very often you will see tracts, nuclei, gray matter, white matter. So we will see what are those structures you see inside the brain and the spinal cord. Then we will talk about the reflex. What is a reflex and what are the parts or components a reflex must have? Okay, so those are the things we will talk about today. First, the functions. <coughs> Your nervous system is the main control system, right? So it performs hundreds of functions, but we can classify or group those functions into three groups. What are those three types of functions? Sensory input, integration, and motor output. Those are the three types of functions performed by the nervous system. Let me give you the example of sensory input. Sensory signal comes from peripheral part and goes go towards the brain that means those signals go towards the brain or central nervous system those are sensory inputs now when i see something the visual signal right that signal goes from the eye to the brain so going from the eye to the brain so that is sensory input make sense if i touch your skin that touch signal goes from the skin to the brain. Make sense? When you smell something, that olfactory signal or a smell signal goes from where to where? From the nose to the brain. Make sense? So those, all those belong to sensory input. You can give many examples. When you hear something, sound, 
from the ear to the brain, right? So all those are sensory inputs. Then the sensory input is processed inside the central nervous system and that processing part is called integration okay that processing of the sensory input is called integration and after that the central nervous system sends signal to the effector organs that means the signal now gets out from the central nervous system to the effector organ and that is called motor output. So going towards the central nervous system is sensory input and going away from the central nervous system or out from the central nervous system is called motor output. Now you see let me give you a good example. If some something <coughs> hot touches your body that temperature signal will go from the skin to the brain, right? So that is what? Sensory input, right? And then your brain will do what? You see, in this case, the brain will first determine if it is hot or cold, right? What kind of stimulus is that? Not only that, brain will quickly interpret how hot is that, right? Is it very hot or not that? It's just warm a little bit. So all those things are processed where? In the brain, right? So that part is called integration. Now, if the brain thinks it is hot and you should move your hand away, signal go will go from the brain to the muscle. You see, in this case, skin cannot move the hand, right? Who will move the hand? The muscle. So muscle is the effector organ who will perform the action. So brain will send signal to the muscle to do what? To move the hand away. So that part is called the motor output going from the brain to the muscle. Another example, if you are thirsty, you are looking for drink. So when you see a glass of water, that picture will go from the eye to the brain, right? So that is what? Sensory input. Make sense? Sensory input. In this case, from retina of the eye to the brain. Now, brain will do what in this case? If it is water or something else, right? If it is water, is it clean water or not? Right? Brain will also interpret the distance of the glass from your body. The shape of the glass because you have to get it, right? So, all those things are quickly interpreted in the brain. That is called the integration, the second part. And then the brain will do what? Send signal to the muscles of your hand because you will move the hand to grab the glass, right, of water. So that is what? Motor output going from the brain to the muscle. So all the functions of the nervous system uh, can be grouped into those three types. Okay, now the divisions of the nervous system. First, we divide the entire nervous system into two divisions, central nervous system or CNS and peripheral nervous system or PNS. The central nervous system consists of a brain and a spinal cord. So CNS and PNS, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system. Central nervous system consists of a brain and a spinal cord. So those two organs belong to the central nervous system. Peripheral nervous system consists of nerves. Okay. You know that we have many nerves in our body. Now, uh, the nerves are divided into two types. 
spinal nerves and cranial nerves spinal nerves and cranial nerves okay now what are the spinal nerves what are the cranial nerves this is your brain and this is the spinal cord so those nerves are attached to the brain those are the cranial nerves okay. and those nerves are attached to the spinal cord In both sides of the spinal cord those are the spinal nerves okay makes sense uh, because cranial is the cranial uh, uh, cavity is the uh, cavity in which the brain is located so from the cranium those nerves arise those are the cranial nerves and from the spinal cord those nerves arise those are the spinal nerves so those are two types of peripheral nerves now uh, the peripheral nerves could be two different types you see here you already know I told you sensory input goes from outside towards the central nervous system, right? So some nerves, for example, this one is taking signal from outside to the brain. So this is one type of nerve and you already know that some nerves take the signal out for the motor output. So you see some nerves take signal towards the central nervous system and some nerves take the signal away from the central nervous system. You tell me the when you see something, the nerve taking the picture from your eye to the brain that is going which way towards the brain, right? And now when the brain sends signal to the muscle that is going away from the brain, right? So some neurons nerves take towards the central nervous system, some away. So these are sensory nerves. Those are taking signal towards the central nervous system. Those are taking signal out from the central nervous system. Those are the motor nerves because they are taking motor signal out. Okay. Same thing. Uh, so these are the cranial nerves attached to the brain. Same thing uh, we see. Uh, what we see in case of spinal nerves, this is interesting that Inside the same nerve, we have some fibers taking the signal towards the spinal cord and we have some nerve fibers taking out. That means inside this spinal nerve, you have some fibers taking the signal towards the CNS, some are taking out. That's why the spinal nerves are called the mixed type nerve because it has both types of fibers. So, sensory nerves, motor nerves, we also have the mixed type nerves. Those nerves have both sensory and motor fibers. Now, sensory, those are taking signal towards the central nervous system, could be somatic or visceral. <coughs> so, sensory is seen here again the sensory nerves taking the signal towards the central nervous system. That means sensory nerves are also called afferent. Afferent means taking towards the central nervous system. Motor nerves take the signal out from the central nervous system. That's why motor nerves are also called efferent. Exit starts with E different nerves. Okay? So sensory nerves are also called afferent nerves. Motor nerves are also called efferent nerves. Okay? Now, sensory or afferent could be somatic or visceral. What is the difference? Here you see somatic 
just know that somatic means or somatic refer uh, refers to the outer structure somatic refers to the outer structures what are the outer structures in your body for example the skin muscles skeletal muscles joints okay so somatic refers to those structures visceral refers to internal organs can you na uh, name few internal organs of your body liver spleen kidneys right those are the internal organs outer organs are what skin skeletal muscles joints right so somatic refers to those outer structures visceral refers to the internal organs now you tell me now you understand if i feel pain in my joint right pain is a sensory signal that will go to the brain so that is somatic sensory or visceral sensory somatic if i feel pain in my skeletal muscle that is what somatic sensory right now if i feel pain in my stomach what is that visceral sensory right visceral afferent or liver or kidneys so somatic afferent and visceral afferent now efferent or motor could be somatic and autonomic now somatic uh, efferent will go to the skeletal muscles okay that is voluntary we know that um, if something hot touches same example i am giving or touches your skin then if you think that it is not that hot it will not harm you you may not move your hand away right but if you think that it it is it can harm you then you will move your hand away right so that is voluntary or involuntary voluntary right so your skeletal muscles are voluntary you know that you can control so the output the motor output that will go to the skeletal muscles that would be somatic or voluntary you can also move the joints bones at the joints voluntarily you decide if you will move or not so somatic motor going from the brain or central nervous system to the muscles or joints for the movement now the motor output could be also autonomic what is that if the temperature increases in your body what happens in the heart rate anybody goes up or down if your body becomes hot in fever when you get fever heart rate goes up right when you do the exercise what happens body temperature increases heart rate goes up so that means what when body temperature increases that signal goes to the brain right your brain then sends signal to the heart and heart rate increases make sense so is that voluntary or involuntary the increase of heart rate involuntary you don't increase that right it happens by itself you see when you get fever if you take the heart rate it goes 100 or above the temp heart rate increases right so that signal going from the central nervous system or brain to the heart that is autonomic make sense so the motor output could be voluntary that is to the muscles or involuntary to the other structures now let me give you another example of involuntary if you are hungry and if you see very delicious food in front of you then what will happen in your mouth secretion of saliva will occur right salivary glands will secrete release saliva 
that uh, that is autonomic or in uh, voluntary autonomic right you don't do that it happens right in your stomach secretion will occur that is autonomic so the autonomic signal uh, can regulate the class the cardiac muscle i gave you the example of heart right and also to the smooth muscles when you are hungry if you see delicious food smell it your stomach will also starts to contract okay slightly so that is smooth muscle you know that internal organs are smooth muscle right so now you got the example of both voluntary motor and involuntary or autonomic motor output the motor could be voluntary and involuntary <coughs> okay now autonomic has two divisions autonomic is controlled by two divisions sympathetic and parasympathetic those are the two branches of autonomic nervous system they just know that work in opposite way example sympathetic activation increases the heart rate so when your heart rate is increased that is done by the sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system parasympathetic decreases the heart rate lowers the heart rate so um, another way we can say when sympathetic activation occurs how your body responds we say uh, uh, fight and flight right response that means uh, when you are excited what kind of changes occur in your body that is the sympathetic activation that is done by sympathetic activation when your body is in relaxed condition in comfortable condition like you are sitting on a couch and watching you know nice beautiful movie you are in comfortable right uh, condition <coughs> that is the activation of parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system so what kind of changes occur during that time if i ask you when you get scared what happens in your heart rate increases right gets faster so that is sympathetic or parasympathetic sympathetic right when you are excited your muscle tone increases right so that is also sympathetic what kind of responses you see during excitation those are done by sympathetic the changes you see during your resting comfortable condition that is what parasympathetic so when you are relaxing your heart rate goes down slightly that is the activation of what parasympathetic makes sense when you are relaxing your muscle tone also goes down right muscles relax so that is parasympathetic activation okay now uh, you see here uh, this is a nice chart showing the divisions of the nervous system first you see in the left side the central nervous system and in the right side peripheral nervous system so central nervous system consists of a brain and a spinal cord right and peripheral nervous system consists of cranial and spinal nerves okay. see first top two boxes left and right okay then peripheral nervous system has two divisions sensory or afferent that i have shown you here so that taking signal towards the central nervous system and motor or efferent exiting okay now sensory could be somatic and autonomic sorry somatic and visceral and motor could be voluntary and autonomic okay then the autonomic has two divisions sympathetic and parasympathetic we have talked all of this now you see in the right side they have shown the nerves by two different colors 
blue and red blue nerves take the signal towards the central nervous system that means sensory or afferent red nerves take the signal away or out from the central nervous system so those are motor or efferent okay so we have talked about all this now the nervous tissue nervous tissue has two types of cells the main cells are the neurons the function of the neurons in one sentence if i ask you what's the function of a neuron production and transmission of electrical signal okay production or generation and transmission of electrical signal when the neurons get excited they produce electrical impulse and that is transmitted through the axon right you know that the process uh neuroglial cells are the supporting cells now um until like a decade ago we didn't know that neuroglial cells are that important but now we know that neuroglial cells are very important they perform a number of important functions in your nervous system some important functions of neuroglial cells are neuroglial cells some neuroglial cells can migrate towards the injured neurons that means some neuroglial cells can move towards the site of injury or inflammation some neuroglial cells can do phagocytosis engulf what do they engulf they engulf the dead cells or abnormal cells or microorganisms bacteria or virus some neuroglial cells can guide the direction of movement which way the new neurons should move after a new neuron is formed by multiplication some neuroglial cells guide them to move towards the location where they will uh, go some neuroglial cells control the chemical environment inside the brain you know that neurotransmitters are different neurotransmitters are present in the brain neurochemicals have you heard that neurotransmitters in your brain acetylcholine or gaba or glycine glutamate those are the neurotransmitters okay so those chemicals or neurochemicals uh, are controlled by some neuroglial cells some neuroglial cells provide insulation covering around the neurons so around the neurons insulation or covering is formed by some neuroglial cells so, so those are some important functions different types of neuroglial cells we have found different types of neuroglial cells present in the nervous system some common neuroglial cells are astrocytes microglia ependymal cells oligodendrocytes satellite cells and swan cells you need to remember these names okay and in next few slides what i'll do i'll just go over these few neuroglial cells and we'll mention one or two important information about these neuroglial cells so you have to remember okay uh, there will be few questions from here too so astrocytes astrocytes why they are called astrocytes because they look like stars 
star-shaped cells are astrocytes. Astrocytes are the most common type of neuroglial cells, most abundant type of neuroglial cells, most commonly found neuroglial cells. Now, function. Just know that astrocytes form the blood brain barrier. Astrocytes form the blood brain barrier. You see in this picture, you see the capillary, the red structure, right? Capillary is a blood vessel, you know that. And around the capillary, you see the astrocyte has formed layer. The processes of astrocytes have formed covering around the capillaries of your brain. And that is called the blood-brain barrier. Why? Inside the capillary you have what? Blood. Blood. Right? All of you know that, right? Inside the capillary you have what? The blood. And outside of the capillary in your brain, you have brain tissue, right? So, astrocytes are doing what? Forming a layer, right? Between the blood and the brain tissue. Make sense? So, that is the blood-brain barrier. The partition between the blood of the capillary and the brain tissue, which is very important. You know that your brain tissue is very sensitive can easily die if any toxic chemical, you know, toxic chemical enters from the blood into the brain tissue, brain tissue may die. So that's why you need extra layer around the capillary to stop those harmful chemicals from entering into the brain tissue. Make sense? So in other parts of your body, the capillaries don't have that blood-brain barrier, that layer because other tissues are strong enough to survive. Microglial cells. Microglial cells are phagocytic cells. That means they can do phagocytosis, engulf the microorganisms or dead cells. Okay? And that's why you see the microglial cell has long processes so they can engulf the microorganisms or dead cells and they provide defensive function. Ependymal cells. Inside the brain, when you will see inside the brain, you will find the cavities inside the brain. So, say this is the brain. Inside the brain, you have few cavities. Like this is a cavity that is called ventricle. Those cavities are called ventricles. Okay? And the ventricles are filled with a fluid. That fluid is called CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. So, inside the brain, you have the cavities, those are called the ventricles and inside the ventricles you have the fluid that is called <coughs> CSR, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, in the wall of the ventricle, you have the ependymal cells like this, kind of flat cells. So, these are the ependymal cells and ependymal cells have cilia. You know cilia, hair like structures like this, okay. soft hair like structures. So, these flat cells in the, attached to the wall of the ventricle, these are the ependymal type of neuroglial cells and they have cilia like this. And the movement of the cilia moves the fluid, moves the cerebrospinal fluid inside the ventricle. So, many cilia, when they move together, that causes the, causes the movement of the fluid. Okay, So, that's the ependymal type of uh, neuroglia. Another type of 
neuroglial cells are called oligodendrocytes. You see oligodendrocytes, you see the cell body is round like a full moon. Nice round cell body. This is the nucleus inside it. And the processes from the cell body go towards the nerve fibers and cover the nerve fibers, multiple layers. Form multiple layers around the nerve fibers. And that is the insulation of nerve fibers. So oligodendrocytes form insulation uh, around the nerve fibers and that covering is called myelin sheath. Okay. So myelin sheath is the insulation or covering formed by the oligodendrocytes. But remember oligodendrocytes form myelin sheath or insulation around the nerve fibers of central nervous system, not peripheral nervous system, around the nerve fibers of the central nervous system, that means brain and the spinal cord only. Satellite cells and swan cells form covering or insulation around the nerves in the peripheral nervous system. So that's the difference. Here, oligodendrocyte form myelin sheet around the central nervous system neurons and here uh, satellite cells and swan cells. Those two types of cells form covering around the peripheral neurons. Now, what's the difference between satellite and swan cells? You see here a neuron, the cell body of the neuron and the axon. Now, the satellite cells form covering around the cell body. You see these are the satellite cells and they form covering around the cell body of the neuron, of peripheral nervous system. This one you must remember. And the swan cells form myelin sheath or covering around the axon of the peripheral neuron. Okay? So that's the difference. One forms around the cell body, another type uh, forms around the axons. So those are different types of <coughs> neuroglial cells and some important information. Now, why you need insulation of the nerve fibers? Anybody? Why you need insulation around the electrical wires? Say loud. Faster. So the signal loss will not occur, right? If it is open, electricity will be lost, right? And you know that nerve fibers transmit electrical signal, right? We ha I, I have mentioned several times electrical signal transmission. So exactly like the electrical uh, wires in your house, they must be insulated. Two important functions. One is the electrical signal will travel faster. That is number one. Number two, the loss of electricity will be less, minimized. Okay. So that's why you need insulation around your nerve fibers because they are working like, you know, transmitting the electrical signal. Okay, so we are done with the neuroglial cells. Now we'll talk about the neurons, the main cells of the nervous system. Neurons are different than other cells of your body because they have some special characteristics or properties. What are the special properties of a neuron? Number one, neurons are long-lived. They can stay alive for 100 years or more. Now, there is a condition. Neurons are long-lived. If they are not bothered, you have to know that. If they are bothered, they will die faster than other cells quicker than other cells. Make sense? So, neurons are long-lived, 100 years or more, if you don't bother them. If you bother them, they will die faster than other cells of your body. For example, if I block the circulation 
to your hand by pressing here. After a couple of minutes, if I release that, your hand will still, you know, be fine, the muscle cells. Now, if I squeeze here, stop circulation to your brain for two minutes, what will happen? Okay. So, you see, no oxygen will go to the brain. So, the cells, neurons will die very fast. So, if you don't bother them, they will stay alive. So that's the property. But they are very sensitive. That is another property. Amitotic. Usually, neurons don't multiply. Okay? A means absence, mitosis. No mitosis or cell division is seen in the neurons. There are few exceptions. That's why I said most. And you know that uh, if brain injury occurs, for example, a stroke, right? Stroke that causes the death of the brain tissue. And if that happens, the person, if the person gets paralyzed, usually he suffers, right? Rest of the life from that because neurons will not multiply to produce that area again. But if you get an injury, an injury in your skin or muscle, quickly skin is formed, right? We know that. Pills. So, brain cells or neurons are usually a mitotic, don't multiply. They need continuous supply of oxygen and glucose. Your brain or neurons need continuous supply of oxygen and glucose. Same example, if I stop the circulation, nutrition and oxygen will not go to the brain and the brain will die, the neurons will die. Neurons produce and transmit electrical impulse that I have mentioned. So those are the properties. Parts of a neuron. If you see a neuron, a neuron has a cell body and a number of processes. A typical neuron Most of the neurons are like this. This is a typical neuron. This is the cell body. And these are the processes. Okay. So this is the cell body. And these are the processes. This is the nucleus. And the processes, there are two types of processes. From one side of the cell body, you will see short, multiple branching processes. These are called dendrites. The dendrites are short, multiple, and they have branches. So these are dendrites. Okay. From the other side of the dendrites, you will see a long single process. And that is called the axon. Okay. So, two types of processes, dendrites and axon. Dendrites are short, multiple and have branches. Axon is single, long and usually no branches. Now, <coughs> at the end of the axon, you have the axon terminal. Axon terminal, the end of the axon. And the area where the axon is attached to the cell body or axon arises from the cell body, this area is called axon hilla. Okay, axon hilla. You can see there, should be, must be there. Yeah, axon hilla. Inside the cytoplasm, you have missile granules, kind of dark granules. Those are called missile granules. Missile granules are actually highly condensed. 
endoplasmic reticulum of the neuron. So highly condensed ER endoplasmic reticulum in the cytoplasm. Uh, Nissel granules are also called nissel bodies. So same thing. Okay, nissel bodies or nissel <coughs> granules. Those are tiny bodies in the cytoplasm. Highly concentrated chemicals are present inside the nissel granules. Then uh, around the axon, you have the swan cells. In the peripheral nervous system, remember, and these swan cells form myelin sheath, okay, like this. So, swan cells form myelin sheath. Now, in between the swan cells, you see there are open spots, those are not covered, and these open spots are called nodes of Ranvier's. Nodes of and here. So, in between the swan cells, you have the empty or uncovered parts, spots, those are called nodes of and here. Now, the direction of electrical impulse, which way the electrical signal travels? Electrical signal travels this way. That means what? That means dendrites bring the signal, electrical signal into the cell body and axon takes the signal out from the cell body. Okay, remember that dendrites bring the signal, electrical signal into the cell body and axon takes the signal out from the cell body. Now you see what happens. This axon terminal ends on the dendrite of next neuron. So this is another neuron and these are the dendrites, the dendrites and the axon terminal ends on the dendrites of next neuron. And then this is axon terminal of the second neuron. So you have the cell body, another cell body here. These are the dendrites, okay, and this is the exit term. So, this way the signal will move, okay. And this is called the synapse, where the previous neuron meets the next one. That means exit terminal ends on the dendrite, that is a synapse. Synapse. That's how the neuron, one neuron, gives signal to the next, okay, exon terminal to the dendrite of the next neuron. <coughs> the synapse is space between the two. There is, there is space, like neuromuscular junction. Right. Exactly same way. White matter, gray matter. If you see inside the brain or the spinal cord, you will see some areas are white, some areas are gray. White areas are called white matters, gray areas are called gray matter. Now, why some areas are white and some areas are gray? Inside the brain and the spinal cord, how the neurons are located. So this is a neuron, this is another neuron. The neurons are located like this. Yep, like this. So these are the neurons, dendrites, cell body. Okay, so now you see what happens. If I see this area, you have what? Many? Any what? Cell bodies. Cell bodies and dendrites, right? In this part. 
if I see this area, <coughs> you have many what? Axons. Make sense? Here you have the cell bodies and dendrites. Now, inside the cell bodies, you have those granules. Those are called what? Nissel granules. Remember that? Nissel granules in the cytoplasm. So, all these cell bodies, cytoplasm, has nissel granules. That's why, because of many nissel granules in this area, this area looks grey. Now, these axons are covered by what? Myelin sheet. Remember? The swan cells form the myelin sheet and the color of myelin sheet is white. So, now you see all these axons are covered by myelin sheet, myelinated. That's why this area looks white. White. Make sense? Because myelin sheet coverings are white coverings. So, now if you see this area, it looks gray. Even without microscope, you can see. If you cut the brain, you'll see gray area. This area looks white. So, this is gray matter. This is white matter. Okay. So, where the cell bodies and dendrites are located, that is what? Gray. gray. And where... Many axons are located white. Classification of neurons. In the nervous system, we see three types of neurons. Those are the most common types. Uh, multipolar, bipolar and unipolar. Unipolar is also called pseudo-unipolar. Now, remember one thing that the neuron I showed you a few minutes ago, that is a multipolar neuron and that is the most common type neuron. Multipolar is the most common type neuron. Multipolar neuron has a cell body, multiple dendrites, okay, and one axon. In the left side, you see two multipolar neurons in the picture. Uh, from the cell body, you see many dendrites and one axon. So that is multipolar. Bipolar. Let me draw here. So if you see a cell body and several dendrites, that's the common type. That is the multi. If you see the cell body, only one dendrite. Remember, the one has arised. That is the only one dendrite and one axon. So, this is bipolar because one, two. One dendrite, one axon. That is the bipolar. If you see, there is no dendrite. This is the cell body and the cell body is attached to the side of the axon. This whole thing is the axon. Okay. This is the cell body. So, no dendrite but the cell body is attached to the side of the axon. That is called unipolar or pseudo-unipolar. Okay, pseudo-unipolar or unipolar. So, <coughs> those are three types of neurons. Now, the synapse. I have already shown you the synapse. Two types of synapse. We see one is the neuromuscular junction that you have seen before. The nerve ends on the muscle fiber, right? You remember we talked about that neuromuscular junction before a few days ago. So that is a synapse, one type of synapse. Okay, nerve or axon ends on the muscle fiber. That is called neuromuscular junction. Another type I have shown you a few minutes ago. This is another neuron, next neuron. These are the dendrites, right? So, axon ends on the dendrites of next neuron. So, this is another type of synapse. So, this is nerve to nerve. This is nerve to muscle. Nerve to muscle is the neuromuscular junction, okay? Why these are called chemical synapse? Because you already know ACH is released here, right? Chemical. 
acetylcholine. Here, different types of neurotransmitters are released. That's why these synapses are called chemical synapses. Reflex. Reflex is a rapid autonomic response to a stimulus in which this is very important a rapid autonomic response it must be rapid fast and spontaneous involuntary autonomic means involuntary in which a particular stimulus always causes the same response now let me give you a good example if i put flashlight on your eye, your people will do what? Constrict, right? Another. Is it autonomic or voluntary? Autonomic, right? You don't do that. It happens. Every time I will put flashlight on your eye, your people will do what? Constrict. Make sense? So this is quick response, but autonomic. Make sense? And every time, if I put the stimulus, Give the stimulus, it will respond same way. Make sense? Same way. It will not dilate. It will always constrict. So those are the three conditions. Must be fast, rapid, autonomic, and every time you present the stimulus, the response should be same. Now, uh, the reflex, the pathway of the reflex is called the reflex arc. It has five components. You remember, reflex has five components. What are those? When I put flashlight on your eye, from the eye, the receptors first get stimulated. Then the signal will go through sensory neurons, sensory nerves to the brain. You already know that. And then brain will integrate. Integration center is the central nervous system. And then will send motor output to the pupil, pupillary muscle. So pupillary muscle is the effector. So those are the five components. Now let me give you another example. If I hit the patellar ligament, you know the ligament here? You have the receptors here. So that receptor will receive that hit signal and will send to the central nervous system, right? Central nervous system will integrate, will send back signal to the muscle, not to the tendon, muscle to cause the movement, right? So those are the five components, receptors, sensory neurons, integration center, motor neurons, and effector is the muscle, okay? So those are the components of the Okay, so I have posted the lab materials, uh, today's lab materials, probably some of you didn't get.